How about 1 Corinthians chapter 10? <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 10. You'll find that after the book of Romans, before the book of 2 Corinthians. I remember I was so excited. I read 1 Corinthians and I loved it. I thought, this is the best book in the Bible as a brand new Christian. It's one of the first books I read through. And when I got to the end, I thought, oh man, it's over. Now what am I going to do? And I turned the page and there it was, 2 Corinthians. And I just, I, I think I actually shouted, yay, <laughs> there's a second one. It's cool, it's all right to be excited about the Word of God. It's the words of life that change us, that give us that eternal life, that, that birth in us that Spirit of Christ that Terry was talking about. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Next week we are going to partake of the Lord's Supper, the emblems of the body and the blood of Christ. And uh, it's a good idea to, to know what that means and, and such like. I'm not gonna talk about that today. Maybe I'll take, talk about it next week when we do it. But uh, he's saying basically we are all one because we've all partaken of Christ. And uh, anyway, he goes on to say, that's not my subject, so I wanna brush past it. But for we, 17, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread, which is Jesus, of course. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things with the, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful or edifying. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each the other's well-being. What the context here is, he said, look at Israel after the flesh. They would offer, what we sometimes don't realize is there are very few burnt offerings offered to the Lord. There was the whole burnt offering, but the rest of the offerings were waved before the Lord or laid on the altar ceremonially and then taken off and eaten. But it was dedicated to the Lord, you see? And, and they did have the whole burnt offering where they would, would put a lamb and, and they'd burn the whole thing as a sacrifice to the Lord completely. But most of the offerings, they had grain offerings, they had various meat offerings, and they were dedicated to the Lord, but then the people would partake of them, like the Passover lamb. The, the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the blood was splashed on the, the doorposts of the house, and then, but then they ate the lamb. And that's, that's kind of, that's the way it worked. In the Israel and in the nations around with their false gods, they'd lay these uh, offerings on the altar to their false god, Mercury, Apollos, Diana, the Ephesians, whatever, and, uh, and then they'd eat of it after they dedicated it to their God. 
And uh, there were so many offerings being dedicated to the Lord or dedicated to false gods in cities like Ephesus or Corinth, which this is written to the Christians at Corinth, and that what they would do was they'd take that meat that was offered to their gods and they'd put it out in the marketplace. And so then you could go and you'd buy the meat and that, you know, you'd buy your dinner tonight. And uh, the Christians were taking offerings that were dedicated to false gods and putting it on their table and eating it. And Paul says, is this right? Israel dedicated things to God and then put it on their table and ate it. But you guys are taking food that has been dedicated to false gods and putting it on your food and eating it. And he says, is the, is the statue anything? No, the statue is nothing. But there is an entity behind that statue. There is an entity behind that statue. You wouldn't believe... Um, I don't want to go into detail because I don't want to get distracted, but when I went to India and began to study Hinduism and all the various gods, do you know the Hindu, uh, Hinduism is, has a, a three-in-one god that uh, rules over all the rest? And, uh, you know, Shiva, Vishnu, and, and uh, can't remember. Brahma. Anyway, and, and it's, a, it's a trinity, just like it's an imitation of the true religion, an imitation of the trinity. And anyway, um, I just was amazed at the similarities between the biblical idolatry and exactly what we're seeing in India. In fact, I read in a book finally that said uh, the purest form of paganism on the world today, in the world today is Hinduism. It's been uh, largely unchanged down through the years since man first turned away from God, you know, when the children of Noah, etc. And, uh, and it's just the similarities between the exhortations of the Bible and what was going on in India were just amazing. Today is October 31st. In the Catholic Church, it's called Hallowed Eve. You have a Christmas Eve, right? And uh, tomorrow is All Saints Day in the Catholic Church, All Saints Day. And that's, that's a day that's dedicated to all the different saints. There's more than 365 saints. I don't know if you were Catholic, you knew that. But there's, and there was a lot of saints that didn't have their own day. You know, like February 14th is St. Valentine's Day, etc. You've got the various saints' days. But there, some of the saints, they ran out of days in the year. And so they said, All Saints' Day is going to be the catch-all for all the saints that don't get their own days. And then the 2nd of November is All Souls' Day. That's for all the people who aren't really saints, but are children of God, and so everybody has their day. And uh, the evening before All Saints today, or All Hallows, Hallow, Hallowed is saint. Hall, you know, saintly, Hallowed, holy, etc. And, uh, and so the evening before is, is All Saints Day's Eve, like the evening before Christmas is Christmas Eve or Hallowed Evening, which is abbreviated Halloween. And, uh, but it's not about the Catholic Church. This day goes back for thousands of years. I have a few notes here, and again, I'm pressed by time here today. But, uh, Hmm. To the ancient Celts, how many know what a Celt is? Do we have any Irish or Scots or British? Not English, that's different. British was before the English came to Britain. 
Got that? Britain was, was Great Britain, and it was the British people, which were Celts. There's, there's many different uh, general races of people, but the original inhabit inhabitants of Western Europe and the British Isles were the Celts, C-E-L-T-S. The, the Boston names their basketball team after them and mispronounces it, the Boston Celtics. I said, can't you even pronounce the word right? Uh, and of course, I'm a little sensitive to it because guess what? I'm a Celt. Anyway, but uh, most of European was Celtic. And as the waves of barbarians, the Germanic tribes, the Huns and such like that, they came over and they slowly drove the Celtic people to the northern France, uh, a little edges in Spain, and then and the British Isles. And so Celtic eventually became uh, associated with Irish because that's where there was the last stronghold of the Celtic people, this little island of, off of Europe, you know. And so that's the Celtic people. And they had a, a religion that went back into 500 years before Christ that was the Celtic religion and it was dominated by a, 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 wit, a, a priesthood called Druids. You've heard of Druids? Have you heard of Merlin the Magician? Merlin was a Druid. And so he's, he's, that's your basic Celtic priest. And uh, they had a nasty religion. They believed that when somebody died, they were uh, encased in the body of an animal. And that once a year, Samhain, the Lord of the Dead, um, it's pronounced, or it's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it's pr pronounced Samhain. And uh, Becky just thought that was funny. She said, look at the name of the street. And we saw the name of the street, and there's all these consonants, way too many consonants that were in Dublin or Cork City or wherever we were. And there's all these consonants. And how do you even pronounce that? We asked somebody, and he said, oh, that's Lickamy. How do you get that out of here? That, but it, it doesn't look at all like it's spelt. It doesn't pronounce it all. Well, that's how Samhain is. Uh, Samhain looks like it should be pronounced Samhain. In fact, there's an old saying, what the Sam hell is going on? And that's basically uh, named after the old god of Samhain, the Lord of the dead. Anyway, Samhain would come down on December 31st evening, or October 31st evening, Halloween, Halloween, and they didn't call it Halloween, they called it Samhain. Anyway, and he would, if you would give enough offerings to please Samhain, then he would release your relatives from the bodies of animals and allow them to go to Celtic heaven. If you didn't, then they're stuck in an animal's body until somebody redeems them. And that's, that's basically the roots of Halloween. It's the Day of the Dead. In fact, in Catholic countries today, it's the Day of the Dead. In Mexico, you say, what's, you know, you know El Dios de Muerte. It's the Day of the Dead. It's, and they honor it. They go to the grave sites and put food at the, you know, in the, in the graveyards in front of their ancestors' graves and everything because it's the Day of the Dead. And they even honored it in Russia with the, uh, not Coptic Church, the, Becky, help me, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, even honors the Day of the Dead because our oldest daughter remembers going and bringing food to the graveyard and putting it by the gravestones. In fact, she remembers her mom not feeding her and she going and getting the food from, that other people put there. So we got some very iffy ideas, or very iffy roots of Halloween. And uh, the best offerings were live animals, horses, humans. They'd put humans or horses, they had, they'd have a pit that was you know, full of logs and such, 
and they'd tie the human or the horse on a grate over the pit and light the fire and roast the human or the horse alive. And if they couldn't afford a horse, horses were the best. Horses have always been big in Ireland, still are today. One of the great symbols of Ireland is their horses. But uh, they would use a black cat, of all things. Hmm, sound familiar? And a lot of the other things are, are pretty familiar too that uh, had to do with this old uh, satanic ritual. Um, the trick-or-treat kind of a deal is, are you gonna buy that soul out of that animal's body or not? Are you going to make that sacrifice or not? Um, the ghosts and goblins, that's all representative of ancient Druid beliefs. The jack-o'-lantern, there's many different uh, stories of the origin. Uh, probably most of them are true in some different areas, but it's basically a soul entrapped in a shell waiting to be released. And witches were, are the followers of the mother goddess, and so the, they were hand in hand with the druid priests and the, and the followers of the mother goddess. And, uh, and both to this day, uh, serious witches uh, still honor the four bonfires a year that the Druids always honored. And I'm sure there are, in parts of Ireland they're still honored. I haven't been in Ireland at a time that was a, one of their holy days. The holy days, by the way, are rather interesting. The first one is Beltane. It's on May 1st, otherwise known to us as May Day. And that was unto the biblical Baal, or Bel in Babylonian, and the second one, um, see if I get this right, is Lamas Day, which is August 1st or 2nd, right in there. And uh, we don't honor, we, you know, we don't have that one in our American history. But you'll notice every year when the Celtic Fair or the Irish Fair is in town, it's always on August 1st and 2nd. And uh, the third one is Halloween. And the fourth one is Candlemas, which is February 2nd. Groundhog's Day, which is a German twist on the same theme. The Germans were originally Celtic too before the you know, barbarians came in and took over. So anyway, long story short, um, there's a lot of nasty stuff involved with this. And it's a lot more serious than eating meat offered to an idol. But Paul is saying, don't even eat that meat. How can you share something that is dedicated to an idol and sit around your table and eat it. How can you defile your table with food that's been dedicated to an idol? And how much more would it be inappropriate for Christians to honor the Day of the Dead and the, the God of Samhain? It's, a, it's really touchy. And we don't take it seriously today. We have a basic worldview conflict. The American worldview, the Western worldview, is, uh, they call it secular materialism. So it's secular in that it's basically not religious. And it's materialistic in that material things are more important to us than spiritual things. That's America, come on. Material things are more important to the average American and, uh, and we're secular rather than spiritual or religious. And we will, you know, the average Christian or average American might go to church on Sundays, kinda, almost half of the Sundays of the year, or maybe just Christmas and Easter. But it's basically a secular lifestyle if that's all your spirituality is. And the same thing with the materialism. People talk about, oh yeah, the real things are love and this and that, but bottom line is, I want that car, you know. It's, it's materialism. And that kind of worldview doesn't take very seriously spiritual things. So when we look at Halloween, we don't see anything wrong with going to a party and dressing up as some person from history or whatever and having a Halloween party or sending our children out for trick-or-treats. 
we don't see any conflict there. But you have to make a decision on your own. Most of us are older, we're not raising children anymore. Uh, Becky and I find ourselves in a, a difficult position. Our six children uh, did not celebrate Halloween. They didn't go trick-or-treating. They, they, we didn't honor it in any way in our home, and they didn't miss it at all. In fact, they, they would get offended. I remember our oldest daughter, Lena, she said, Papa, look at that. And a yard would be all decked out with Halloween stuff, you know, like you see some, like, like they used to do Christmas, now they do Halloween. Halloween is a close second to Christmas in the amount of money spent. Americans spent half a billion dollars last year on costumes for their pets. And when it comes into the uh, costumes for people and the total money spent uh, during Halloween, uh, you know, for Halloween, it's in the billions, you know, easily. It's, it, like I said, it's second only to Christmas, and it's a close second now. Used to be a distant second, now it's a close second. I wouldn't be surprised if it passes up Christmas before it, the next 10 years are out, I'll tell you. It's become popular, and of course, nobody takes it seriously because we don't believe in spirits and ghosts and goblins and demons and things offered to idols. But the Bible says the spiritual world is more real than the physical world. 2 Corinthians 4.18, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now Christians, we've switched our loyalties to the Bible and God, but we have not effectively thrown off the world view. We still don't take the realm of the spirit seriously. I wish people would just turn off their phones to begin with. Anyway, I don't know who that was, so, but, because it throws me off for one thing. <laughs> I'm just starting to get into the rhythm here. Come on, baby, here we go. All right. Can I hear an amen out there? <laughs> All right, okay. Look at here. We, we know very little about curses, blessings, and how this kind of thing affects our lives. Do you know you can curse somebody? Certain occult practitioners can literally drop a person dead in their tracks by just cursing them. Their demons are powerful enough to drop a person dead in their tracks, seriously. And blessings, when you bless somebody, we all say, well, God bless you. But that's, that's, it's like taking the Lord's name in vain. It's essentially, it's exactly what it is, because we're really not blessing them. If you're gonna bless somebody, you say, the Lord bless you with riches, and the Lord give you the desires of your heart, and may you find that wife you've been looking for, and Bob, you, you bless them, amen? But, you know, just saying God bless you is, is like saying, darn it all anyhow. Same thing. But because we don't take the realm of the spirit very seriously, we're still basically in that secular, materialistic mindset. Even though intellectually, and to some degree, we're getting converted to a more spiritual uh, worldview, but it really takes a long time, and a lot of Christians, this sermon is just going to go over their head, and they're going to say, there goes Kim again. You know, he thinks that there's a demon under every bed. This, you know, they, they don't take it seriously, but folks, demons are serious. False gods are serious. And they're real. They're not the statue, they're the powers behind them that get the people to worship them. 
Do you know the, what the most worshipped object in Hinduism is? And this is Hinduism. This is a billion people, or one-fourth to one-fifth of the world's population. Do you know what their most popular worship item is? Shiva's phallus. Even Shiva himself worships it. I walked into a house and they, were, they invited us in for tea and to hear the gospel. And they were a Hindu family, but I thought, praise God. You know. I walked in there and the first thing I saw was this big, you've seen Indian art, you know, the, just the super colorful, lovely paintings. And this, this thing was big, it was bigger than, you know, maybe about that big, and it's Shiva. And he's sitting there, and you can tell Shiva, he's blue, <laughs> and so is Krishna. But anyway, he's sitting there, and there's this big tube coming in front of him with a cap on it, and he's pouring oil on it. And I turned to Brother Emmanuel, my Indian partner, and I said, is Shiva doing what I think he's doing? Yes, brother, he is worshiping his own Ling. Ling is the Hindu, or Hindi word for his sexual organ. That's the most worshiped object in Hinduism. Maybe the most worshiped object in the world, considering that Hinduism is so prevalent. My point today is we have to seriously look at innocent demonic activities. We don't want to continue to perpetuate the pagan roots of our pre-Christian culture. We want to Christianize our culture, especially in the church. We, we have no business honoring Halloween, for example. For that matter, I could make an argument about Christmas because Christmas has nothing to do with Christ. Christmas is a celebration of Saturnalia. The, big, the greatest god among the Romans and Greeks was Saturn, or Kronos to the Greeks and Saturn to the Romans. And uh, he's the father of Zeus and Poseidon and Hades. And he's the father of all the gods. And his holy day was December 25th. Saturnalia. And so when they Christianized the Roman Empire, they said, well, we don't worship Saturn anymore, we worship Christ. Let's change that to Christ Day instead of Saturnalia. Let's change it to Christernalia or Christmas. And uh, the same thing with the Easter. The uh, Pope Innocent the Fourth or whatever in uh, about the 1300s, declared what became uh, the calendar. Who's the, what, the calendar pope? I can't hear you. Gregory. The Gregorian calendar, yeah. It was Pope Gregory the Fourth or something. Anyway, so Pope Gregory finally decided what Easter was, and he said Easter is the closest Sunday to the spring sol solstice. And that's why it bobs around every year and you're wondering because it's the closest Sunday to the spring solstice, which means what? They're still worshiping the sun. Jesus was born, was crucified around that time, okay? 50 days before Pentecost. Of course, they gauged Pentecost from Easter, which is gauged according to the spring solstice. Uh, and as far as Jesus' birth, all indications are that he was born in October, in, in all reality. Just the sheep in the field and the various things that were taking place in, uh, would have been uh, in October. And people argue about that. Some people are so, oh, but it could be Christmas. Really, it really could. And, you know, let's be wise here. Let's not be sentimental. But in any case, we do honor Christ on Christmas and on Easter, except, do you know what Easter means? Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of sex and fertility. So we celebrate the
the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and we name it Ishtar. Unbelievable. But that's how mixed up we are in our culture with our pre-Christian and our post-Christian culture. But you and I should not be mixed up. We're real Christians. We're not Christians because we're born in America. We're Christians because we're born again. I was starting to say, we never had any Halloween uh, with our children, but now we have a grandchild and her mommy takes her out trick-or-treating. And uh, we can't hardly argue with that. It's her child. And we, don't, we have a reasonable relationship with mommy. Her mommy's not our daughter. Our, her, her daddy is our son. Uh, if you, you know Kimari, our, daughter, our granddaughter is all, often here. Anyway, and uh, so her mom takes her out trick-or-treating and everything. And so, and then she said, oh, Becky, would you please make her costume this year? And so Becky's laboring on this costume for her. And uh, was just torn, torn, you know what I mean? What do you do? What do you do? And we just pray over her. Lord, just put your hedge of protection round about her. I don't want any demon salivating as he sees this innocent child walking around dressed up like a spider. And uh, it's a tough place to be in when it's not really your call, you know. But when it is your call, make the call for Jesus. Switch your loyalties completely over to the kingdom of God. First Thessalonians chapter 5, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil and dressing up like witches and goblins and going around for offerings to which is typical of the ancient tradition of freeing the souls from their shells that's definitely the appearance of evil another place it says free flee from idolatry again first corinthians 10 14 this first scripture i read Brethren, flee from idolatry. I guess I have a one-point sermon. Flee from idolatry. Take it seriously. It's not harmless. Our innocent, harmless traditions are not so. They're, they seem so because we are coming from a secular, humanistic worldview. Secular, materialistic. Humanistic too, of course. Worldview, instead of a spiritual worldview. But if we really put on a spiritual worldview, we take this stuff a lot more seriously. So, God bless you. I mean that. Let's stand. I, I just about laughed out loud when Larry said, yeah, they were practicing, and Kim said, this ain't going nowhere. Let's go back in the back room and pray. And that's literally what happened. He was sitting right there, and, uh, and I was actually quite grumpy. And uh, he waved at me and said, good morning, Kim. Anyway, and we did. We went back there, and we came back with a whole new song list, and, and it worked. God moved, you got blessed. God got glorified, praise God. We can do wonderful things when we're tuned into the Spirit of God. I was tuned into the spirit of musical perfectionism. I was a professional musician. Um, I was in two paying rock bands before I was a Christian. I like to say I graduated, I was in, I played rhythm guitar in the first band and lead guitar in the second band. 
But, uh, and I still have that kind of perfectionism. Like, you know, that isn't perfect. We're not quite hitting all the downbeats together here. And, you know, Kim, relax, man. We're worshiping God here. And it works when you get in the spirit, not in the flesh. The same thing relates totally to the sermon. It works when we're tuned into the spiritual things, not the fleshly things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God.